ultra low contrast techniques in complex and high risk coronary interventions. My name is Goran Stanković and we have great team today. Uh, spokesperson Alif uh, Alnuriani, then we have as a discussant Mirva Talasnag, Javier Escanet, who was also the program producer, and I thank him for great program. Uh, Roni uh, Shantouf and uh, Omar Goktekin, I think, will join us in a second. So uh, the main objectives of today's program are to understand how decreasing operator dependence on contrast use may increase both safety and the quality of PCI in complex scenarios. Then to learn key tips and tricks and become familiarized with specific tools for ultra low contrast PCI. And to provide practical step-by-step -step example using recorded ultra low contrast PCI intervention. And it's my pleasure to invite uh, Javier uh, to give introductory talk and present uh, ultra low contrast PCI why, who, and how. Javier? Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Salah Javier. So it's a pleasure to be with you, uh, sharing with you some of these concepts of ultra low contrast PCI, something that uh, we are really finding very useful in the management of our very complex patients. The, first, the, the, to start with, it would be important with, to remember that Angiography still plays the same key central role that it was played at the time of Andreas Grunzig performing PCI. We use it in many cases to select PCI candidates, to identify flow limiting lesions, plan the intervention, choose the devices, decide when we have achieved a good result of the intervention, and to establish the cause of PCI failure. And it's been interesting because why do we stick so strongly to angiography, the only technique that was available to Andreas Grunzig, when we have so many techniques that we use nowadays in, that are available to us and that actually we use in some of our interventions, like for example, for, uh, for TAVI implantation, we rely on techniques that is not just on geography. So 45 years later, we have all these tools, but also 45 years after the inception of PCI, our patients have changed a lot. And to put it in a communicative way, you have here a picture of Dolph Bachmann, who was the first patient treated by Andreas Grunzig. You, of course, you all know that. Uh, and, and you have the, the picture at the time of the intervention and the picture at the time of the follow-up in the anniversary of uh, the 40th anniversary of uh, PCI. And you can see that here we have an entirely different individual with a cardiovascular uh, biography, so to speak, number of interventions, probably he has also other conditions, we don't know, but that's the type of patients that we are treating nowadays, patients that are elderly patients, patients that have survived different type of disease, they may have survived oncological disease, they have survived uh, myocardial infarctions, they may have had uh, cabbage, PCI, uh, they may have chronic kidney disease, all of this, in a way, configurating or, or, or generating what is called the uh, scenario of complex and high-risk interventional procedures, situation where we are treating uh, patients that are elderly and with a lot of comorbidities. Now, how these comorbidities influence the way that we treat our patients? For example, if we, if we take CKD as a way of uh, to understand how it influences our patients, we can look to very contemporary data coming from the ischemia trial. At the left, you can see that in patients that had normal renal function, the, uh, in the, that were allocated to the initially invasive arm, around 80% uh, patient, of the patients were uh, underwent coronary revascularization. At the right, you can see what happened in the same study for patients that have CKD. Coronary revascularization was only offered to them in 50% of the cases. And this that is, uh, is part of what is called renalism, which is the, so to speak, the, the bias of the operator to deliver um, interventions or to deliver high quality treatment to patients that have chronic kidney disease with the fear of causing acute kidney injury is really, really important to take into account. But I will go one step further. 
if you could take the magnifying glass and you could have a look on how these 50% of patients with chronic kidney disease were treated, and you look to the quality of revascularization, you will be surprised. Because you will find that many of these patients basically were treated suboptimally. When I was trained to do interventional cardiology, I remember that my supervisor was telling me, in a patient with CKD, you have to make it very quickly, you go very quickly, deploy the stent, get out. And of course, these patients, as we know, are something that does not, does not work in these patients, because these patients, if you do that, well, first, of course, you have the risk of acute kidney injury as a consequence of contrast administration in this patient. But the second thing is that we know that these patients have very extensive calcific widespread coronary artery disease. And performing an intervention in these patients is, will never be successful if you take the rule of get in, deploy the stent, get out. On top of that, we know that these patients, by definition, are high bleeding risk patients. And that means that when you perform an intervention, you have to be aware that the chances that DAPD has to be stopped are much higher than in other patients. So when you start looking at that, and again, thinking of CKD as an example of patient complexity, you understand that uh, not relying on contrast opacification to perform PCI uh, benefits the patient in two ways. First, because you improve the safety of the procedure by decreasing the amount, the possibility of acute kidney injury. Also, by achieving a good result that will decrease the possibility of stent thrombosis if DAPT has to be stopped. And of course, will improve the quality of PCI because it will give you leeway to perform thorough plaque preparation, uh, assessment with intracoronary imaging, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that you have achieved a good job, complete revascularization, and durable results of your intervention. And when you look at that from that uh, twofold perspective of increasing safety and increasing the quality of PCI, you understand that there are many other situations where relying less on contrast opacification is very useful. Of course, here you have uh, patients, again, that have comorbidities related to kidney dysfunction, but you can have the patient with a shock or out of uh, hospital cardiac arrest, or you can have any patient where you have anticipated long procedures like multivessel disease or CTOs. Actually, the way I learned ultra low contrast PCI was as a CTO operator, and if you go to CTO courses, you will see that probably are the only ones that devote one particular lecture to avoiding contrast because it is one of the limiting factors in achieving a, a good result in these uh, long and complex interventions. And here you have a plot of all these different situations where you can see how ultra low contrast PCI may benefit the patient either by improving safety, by improving the quality of PCI, or by improving both. At the top, you will probably have the very complex patients with uh, chronic kidney disease who have extensive calcific coronary artery disease. At the other end, you will have the regular PCI, where probably there is no much, say, uh, difference in performing it in the regular way or in performing it uh, with ultra low contrast PCI. But these are the patients that we are treating nowadays. Uh, how would you embark in performing PCI in a patient like this? He has a, he's an, he's an elderly patient who had previous intervention to the right coronary arteries with stents in this shepherd's crook, and now has a disease in the right coronary artery, multivessel disease, proximal LAD, mid, uh, and perhaps left main. He has a CKD stage 3, 4, creatinine clearance of 30, and a prior stroke, high bleeding risk. Again, the aims of performing an intervention in this patient is to improve procedural safety, to perform a complete thorough intervention without being limited by contrast administration, to increase the precision of PCI, and finally, to benefit the patient from applying intracoronary imaging and physiology guidance, guidance, which, by the way, are the tools that you use in this, uh, in, this, in this approach. For example, a contemporary way of approaching this is that you take the previous angiogram of the patient, uh, before anything else, you perform functional coronary angiography to understand where is the flow limiting stenosis that you have to treat, etc. You go and perform an intervention without any contrast, and you double check your results with intracoronary physiology. And then you perform a final injection where you can see that you have achieved a good result and you have no, com no, no um, complications. And how to do it? 
We are going to see that later in the case that we have recorded for you. But in a nutshell, there are solutions for every step, for every, so to speak, um, question that the intervention may have, like how to engage the ostium, how to advance the wires if I'm not using contrast, how do I know uh, the, the, where is the stenosis I have to treat, how much contrast can we use, when should we use it, and also uh, how to evaluate what is the result of the intervention. But, but we will leave that for the life case, which probably will be a, a much pro more practical way of sharing with that. In the meantime, the key aspects to remember is that ultralow contrast PCI is an, I believe, an indispensable skill in complex PCI chip. It is applicable in many more scenarios than chronic kidney disease, contributes to improve safety and quality of complex PCI, and requires a fundamental change in mindset and learning some skills, but most of the equipment is already available in your cath lab. So with this, uh, Goran, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Javier. I would like to invite you to either take uh, stand, uh, standing microphones to ask questions or to send questions via app. We'll be happy to answer all your questions. Maybe I can start by asking Javier, uh, uh, you mentioned that we are not only increasing safety, but we are also optimizing procedural result. So do we need special equipment to do that? Uh, uh, I like the idea as a concept of decreasing dependence on use of contrast, not uh, only ultra low contrast, but the whole philosophy of being less dependent on use of contrast probably requires some equipment. And can you elaborate on that? Well, you, you will be surprised that actually um, you have at your hands in, in every cat lab many things that will support you in this um, change in mindset. Like, for example, being able to display the previous angiogram that you can do from a sophisticated standpoint, being able to display it in your monitor, and from the, so to speak, uh, poor man's attitude, making a photocopy of the, of the uh, angiogram and putting it, you know, with uh, tape in front of you, so you keep it as a sort of roadmap. Very simple stuff. Uh, it's true that probably the only thing that you really need is to have intracoronary imaging. That probably is the only, the only requirement you need. And, and most likely it is IBUS because um, you do not need to ingest, inject contrast. Even if you would be doing OCT with saline, there are situations in ultra low contrast PCI, like for example, the management of um, dissections in which you will not like to make injections uh, later. But uh, I, hopefully the case will illustrate, Goran, that um, every, every colleague has in his, her lab, cath lab, the, the tools needed to start with this. Yeah, I'd like to hand over to Arif now. Yeah, thank you, Goran, and thank you, Javier, for the nice presentation. I mean, I would, uh, I have some uh, issue the way how I deal with my patient. I mean, when I talk about safety and quality of uh, outcome or the optimization, I'm not aiming only the CKD, and that's one of the objective of this session, is how do I apply this routinely in my daily practice? How do I get this to into routine daily practice? So I may address this question. Maybe we start with the ladies first, Dr. Mervet. Maybe how would you do this in your, do you really target certain subgroup or do you do it in general? Well, thank you for asking. And actually, I think if you want to get to the level where you're comfortable using less com contrast in complex cases, you have to start getting comfortable with the simple cases. So if you have a routine of, in, in a simple type A lesion where you create this routine for yourself. I'm gonna pass the wire and then I'm gonna do my intravascular ultrasound, I'm gonna do some co-registration and based on that I'll do my dilatation, stenting and so on. And, and then when you get to the complex lesions and when you get to the patients with kidney disease where it really matters, you and your team are already trained, sort of speak, to get to that level. So you would wait rather in a more complex scenarios to use this kind of advanced technique rather than going for simple cases because you're worried about safety, you want to guarantee that everything is fine and the risk is low in those cases. Is that what I understand? So what I'm saying is it, you need to do it in complex cases and patients who have kidney disease, but it's important to train yourself to be able to do that with the simpler cases. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Ronnie, uh, yeah, maybe? Um, I think uh, it's important. To ha it actually starts with the culture of the lab itself. 
And so it's not just the operator. You really need to have your staff on board, the nurses on board. So one of the things that we implemented um, when we started to see, this was actually years ago, a change in the AKI rates or the CIN rates was, um, so for example, our nurses screen. So all CKD patients end up in the biplane room automatically. So it's already, the, cult, the, the everybody's on board. We also announce as part of our sign-in a contrast threshold. So we have the contrast threshold, and we also announce an 80% of the threshold. So really, our goal as the operator is to not go beyond the 80% threshold because, you know, as much as we want to see the CIN rate, once that's happened, that's happened. So really, what are the things that we can do in the lab to make a difference? So those have been some of the non-operator dependent situations that we've done to just make that. And it's really heightened and then also hydration. So actually our nurses screen and make sure all patients are hydrated pre and post. And we have an algorithm that's built in for all patients. So anybody with a essentially normal EF, no valvular disease, um, automatically gets hydrated. And if there's any flags, low EF, they have a conversation with the interventionalist to make a decision. So I think those are some of the strategies, at least without even talking about the intervention itself. I have a, a question to Omar, a little bit. Do you monitor your operators regarding how many of them, how much contrast they use per case? Do you do some kind of monitoring this kind of uh, procedures? Um, yes, uh, yes, we do, Arif. And also we have certain uh, protocol, how we do it, uh, to reduce contrast. I think this is a very important point to use less contrast in routine practice because we can do something. For, for example, first we gave natural <laughs> before doing anything and after we, we, we take two for left system, spider and right, right cranial. And after that, we choose wisely next uh, position. So, and secondly, uh, for example, if we if we like to give nitro or or heparin, we just we first unload the the guiding. We just bleed the guiding because there are some contrast inside. If we inject nitro, they will go f uh, for no reason. And the other, I think, important thing to do is uh, b before inject, uh, you know, it's keep to a uh, guiding catheter with contrast. If there is sudden insight when we inject. The contrast will be not enough to to see the coronary coronary, and then then we we need to have another injection, which is not good. And in our uh, lab, what we do, we wire. We know the uh, we, we 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 are a little bit uh, you know anxious about to use contrast because we have lots of uh, elderly and complex beside in, in in our lab. So we do uh, ballooning first, for example. If we see <clears throat> opening, it's fine. If not, we go bigger balloons. And we put stent. And when we put the stent, we just contrast to, to see uh, distal and proximal landing zone. And after that, stent implantation, post dilatation. <laughs> if we use IOS, do IOS first. Everything is fine. And then we have Final image. I think that will come back again with Khafir. He will demonstrate to us how he did in the case. Yeah. We have a question here from yeah, Just a, a very quick uh, common question. One of the most important reasons to do um, also ultra-low contrast technique, which was not mentioned, is to avoid renalism, which is uh, having patients with uh, severe CKD being denied uh, life-saving, possibly, uh, treatment because of fear of dialysis. And we've seen nephrologists stopping it. So to, to actually be able to do it, to say, no, no, we'll, we'll do the PCI without contrast or with 10 cc's of contrast. And most patients don't need to do dialysis. So this is, in our area at least, is a, a big factor in patients not going to get the treatment uh, because of, of uh, high creatinine. Thank you, Dr. Hani. Uh, Javier, can I ask you a question regarding uh, dynamic coronary roadmap? Uh, I've seen the study that you presented that uh, use of this technology is helping in reducing uh, radiation and also reducing the use of contrast. Uh, can you please uh, share more on this uh, result? Sure. So then, uh, for the colleagues that they don't know it, Dynamic coronary road mapping is, looks like an artificial intelligence thing. It's not actually a technology of artificial intelligence, but it's really amazing. And what it does is uh, you, you perform a cine angiogram, and then the system immediately generates a dynamic mask. Um, like a silhouette. Uh, like a silhouette, which is uh, transparent and is displayed on the fluoroscopy screen while you continue working. So you can see 
how your wire is being navigated through this mask, which is synchronized with the heartbeat. It's amazing. And it uses not EKG, it uses the movement of the guiding catheter to synchronize the, the image. Now, the, as you say, um, it was important to demonstrate objectively that there was a benefit and that was obtained with the DCR for contrast, an international uh, randomized trial that is about to be published in your intervention, by the way. And, um, and it demonstrated that you decrease significantly the amount of contrast. Interestingly, you, you decrease more the contrast with the higher the complexity of the case. We did an analysis looking to vessel syntax score, and you can see that those uh, PCIs that ha were more complex from an anatomical perspective is where you really uh, spare more contrast. So it's a, it's a very useful tool and very reassuring, of course, for the physician because you can see where you are not only advancing your wire, but also positioning your stents, or even correlating the image that you have with uh, intracoronary uh, um, ibus or whatever, and, and the anatomy. Yeah, looks very impressive. Uh, I want to ask Omer about, uh, you are used to reverse CART and other sophisticated CTO techniques, and you have an issue of having atrogenic dissections. How do you manage that, uh, trying to limit the amount of contrast that you use? Yes, you know, that's a very good point. If we have integrate approach and if we have dissection integrately, we shouldn't inject any contrast. This is our protocol. So we do whole procedure without contrast until we implant some stents. So if we inject co contrast, uh, obviously we may have more. So for retrograde approach also, we can use very few amounts of contrast that we can finish retrogradely CTO case. That's, I think, advantage of using, you know, uh, bilateral guiding and then to, to, to use retrograde approach for CTO. That, that's, uh, we do this for years. Um, you know, I, I have seen first from Kato Sanse years ago, he finished one case retrogradely less than uh, 10 ml. So it's, it was amazing, wow. but, but... Yeah, I think that, that you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fantastic example of the problem that we have in depending with um, dissections. Whenever you have a iatrogenic dissection, left main gets dissected, etc., the ST elevation starts to go up, the whole cat lab becomes very, very nervous. And the typical reaction is that someone tries to advance a wire, it's not going into a true lumen, people get more nervous, Make us, give me an injection, give me an injection. And you know, and, and, and the operator is trying to, to like a sort of magic to see that things are getting better by making <laughs> injections, which of course is making things much worse because it's hydraulically extending this. So uh, what Adomar says, this was systematized in the city of world, but nowadays, we use it in the very occasional um, dissection, iatrogenic or spontaneous. And I will be more than happy to share with you uh, during the meeting some of the recorded cases we, yeah. we show of how I this is actually managed, yeah. which is the rule. I mean, stop making injections, put an IBUS catheter in the false lumen. And, and, from, and from then onwards, make sure that you guide the reentry properly, understand yeah. what you have to do. Learn how to uh, stem the ostium without making injections, putting a, a wire in the valsalva sinus. Very simple things, but that makes a huge yeah, maybe difference. Maybe we can go through the case that you introduced in the beginning with shepherd's crook, with tight lesion distally, osteal LAD, distal left main. Uh, plenty, yes, please. Go on. Plenty of complex. While he's preparing, I want to ask how long we should wait after diagnostic angi angiogram to the PCI in CKD patients? What do you think? What is the earliest time in your practice? Yeah, uh, or maybe we can uh, ask Ronnie to... Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, uh, you, we should be waiting at least three to five days uh, in reality. I mean, I know sometimes that's hard seven, if they're yeah. an inpatient and that becomes a little difficult and your referring physicians are sitting on you, but this yeah. but it becomes critical for the CKD mm -hmm. patients to give that space. I yeah, think it depends from a case to case. I mean, you can see the risk of the lesion. Is it urgency of the lesion? You can modify. I mean, each case is different. Sometimes you need to go out three, four days once it's optimized. But I will not go in as long as the tendency is going down to the normal range. So I wait really a day or two, 48 hours at least. If there is no urgency, I wait a month even. Let him recover. Let him go home and come back. So we'll go to Hafir. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Arif. So the, what I'm going to show you is um, it's basically a recorded case, and, and, and we took as a 
we, we, that's the reason why we were sharing you this case before. You already know the patient, the complexity of the patient. In this patient, of course, you have the concomitant chronic kidney disease, but you may think that you will be applying the same to someone in whom you anticipate that is a challenging case and you do not want to be limited by contrast administration. So um, the first thing is to, this, to have a roadmap, and what we do is actually the previous diagnostic angiogram displayed in front of us. And, and you know, and with that, is, it will be very simple to wire it. But first, where is the ostium? And this is a very simple way to know if you have engaged the ostium. Make an injection of saline and look through the EKG. Unless you have a left bundle branch block or, you know, if you have baseline changes, if you are able to elicit changes with saline injections, you are, in the, in the, you are already engaged. So from there, you know, it's a piece of a cake to navigate the wire in this particular case. Remember, the shepherd's crook is extended. So I decided not to go with an AL1 or something because I anticipated difficulties. And this is the difficulty I have, of course. I, I'm unable to cross with the, with the IBUS. And the, the drug eluting stent will not go either. So, uh, so how, what to do? I mean, it's, I don't think that I will be able to do this with a guide extension catheter, so I use a reverse trapping technique. You can see that in one of the wires is holding the other one. And look at the stent now traveling down through the wire that is being holded by the balloon. Then when Pablo, my colleague, deflates, I pull the balloon while I advance the stent, and you will see how nicely it advances the last uh, part of it, and then I was able to put that. So it's, in a way, it's, it's trying to find a solution for the fact that, you know, if I try to engage this with a, um, um, AL1 or you know, try to advance a um, guide extension catheter, chances of advancing this are very small unless I perform aggressive dilation of this previously extended stent, which, if possible, I would like to avoid. Okay, so at this point, um, and we have the stent in place. I made a, 50, a diluted uh, injection. We firm it um, at a higher frame rate because the diluted contrast travels down much faster than the 100% contrast. And we deploy the stent. And, and, and now comes uh, understanding uh, what we have here. Okay, so the stent we have deployed is, is, looks okay. Uh, but we are going to make co-registration without um, contrast because we don't want to invest contrast for this. We, we, we will co-register with the silhouette of the wire, which is very simple. Uh, and give, give us basically the same information we want. And, and looks very bad. Looks like there is very extensive disease all over the mid-segment of the right coronary artery. And as a matter of fact, when you look to to the with with an additional wire pressure guide wire you see that i'm leaving the other two uh, down the vessel when i examine this and perform longitudinal vessel interrogation we find this very nasty pattern of diffuseness which is very difficult to manage so we have to now come to make decisions on the strategy if i treat only these segments uh, the result will be uh, still suboptimal uh, ifr of 0.84 if I treat the previously extended segment, which of course has challenges, I will be probably all right, 0.91. But another alternative is that I treat just these two segments, and then I have an even better result, 0.92, and I avoid engaging a segment that has previously implanted uh, stents, which of course, if you treat, you have more possibilities of, of um, stent failure. So, uh, and this is, the, this is based on the um, uh, co-registration with um, the wire, the length I should be using. It will be something like 50 millimeters of stents for that particular segment. We, of course, perform the, the measurements that are required to understand the, 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 the dimensions of the stents. It takes, uh, and, and of course, one of the good things that we have with this system is that measurements are very, very accurate. And now comes um, the deploying. Of course, I'm bringing back the second wire so it does not get gel between the two stents. Um, we use also a stem boost, which help us in understanding that we are making the right overlap with the, stent, the distal stents. Um, and we proceed stepwise, you know, with this. Um, again, sometimes what we do is also we use uh, rotational angiography, so we have a better appreciation if we have an even expansion of the stent. I need to perform again reverse trapping 
to deploy the more proximal stain, a larger one. I'm doing that with the balloon, as you could see. Deploying the, the, the second stent. And of course, once that we do that and we optimize with, uh, with IBUS, if possible, if possible, then we um, check also with physiology if we have achieved the result that we wanted. Um, again, this, these techniques that you can see here of stent enhancement, I believe that they are very useful because it helps you to see if you have um, an even expansion of the, um, of the balloon, etc. So this is the um, IFR, the IFR pullback. You can already see that we have achieved the type of value we predicted in the region of 0 0.91, 0 0.92, um, and no focal jump or whatever. And after that, we performed a final injection of contrast. I mean, we, the, we, we tried to perform IBOS interrogation. It was difficult. and. We were happy, you know, with the previous, um, with, with the information we had so far. And this is the final injection. Do you need to make this final injection? Well, probably you don't need it because you have the information of IBUS, but we, we already, we still want to have final injection to make sure that there is no distal perforation. And also perhaps for legal purposes, having a documentation of the final result is good. So we move now to the to the LAD left main, trying to understand what happens here. Again, checking that we are engaged. Remember that the image you had there is from the previous angiogram. We have performed no injections so far here. Um, we wire the LAD and the circumflex following the um, the information we have here. And here you have an entirely different type of pattern, of physiologic pattern. You saw before um, a diffuse pattern of disease. This is a very focal pattern, as you can see. And it is, of course, focalized, as you can see, when we co-register with the wire in the left main proximal LED. So we have to treat, it is clear that we have to treat these particular segments. It's very interesting in these very diffusely diseased vessels. That's, that's basically what we have to do. So we simulate the results, uh, again, to make sure that this is feasible. Of course, you, can, you, you will bring this to an IFR of 0.98. Uh, and from then onwards, um, we go to the next step, that is understanding the substrate using uh, intracoronary imaging uh, to understand if we need to perform plaque preparation or, or anything else. And, and, and that's, that's basically what we are, uh, what we are doing now. Now, when we, um, when we performed, um, uh, we could not advance the IBUS, so we performed first a small predilation with a balloon. This allowed us to go with the IBUS, and the IBUS revealed that there was extensive calcification with a, a ring of calcium, 360 degrees, located, uh, as you can see here, in the proximal, in the osteal LAD left main. Uh, indicating that, of course, we need to perform proper uh, plaque preparation. We use lithotripsy, a 3.5 balloon, and uh, subsequently, um, seeing that the balloon was opening widely, all the four atmospheres indicating that you had good plaque preparation, um, then we uh, planted a stent. You can see the wire in the uh, Valsalva sinus to know where the ostium was, so there was no need for, for making an injection. Pot, because we knew already that that was um, required. Ibus, to make sure that everything was uh, looking good. And um, this, these are the results that we are getting with, with Ibus, as you can see, good result of plaque preparation that allows good expansion of the stent, as you can see, very nice. And finally, um, typically, as, as we always do, as I mentioned before, we like to uh, have a final injection just to make sure that we document what is the result. So that's, in a way, zero contrast PCI is no more than the extension of ultra low contrast PCI. You do not always uh, need to perform it. And this is the look at the huge improvement in hemodynamics, IFR of 0.95. So the final injection with uh, diluted contrast. So in summary, 
We use for this patient with multivessel disease and all the challenges that you saw, 25 milliliters of contrast. We could perhaps be uh, used even less, but remember that we were well below the um, um, EGFR of 30, so that we were very, very safe. The patient actually was evolved very nicely and was uh, discharged two days later without uh, modification of serum creatinine. So, so hopefully this case, uh, Goran and Arif, has illustrated these, you know, big questions that the colleagues have at the time of transition into ultra low contrast PCI. The list of um, aspects that you have here. Um, there are many other, other small tips and tricks that we can share, but that's probably something that we can do. Yeah, now in this excellent. Discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Javier. Uh, let me ask you. Uh, I saw that you recommend to use uh, less than one for EGFR value, is it individualized in certain ranges below 30 or throughout the spectrum of EGFR? It, it, it is particularly important when you have an EGFR of 30 or less. It is particularly important. Um, you, you have a more of, li of a leeway when you have, for example, an EGFR of 50. Uh, so to the point that, for example, in very complex cases where we have an EGFR of 60-50, sometimes we consider to perform a CT angiogram um, if we think that that is going to help us in understanding better, you know, the calcification, uh, vessel size, distal to acronym, total occlusion, or whatever. So yeah. it gives you more knee wave. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for an excellent uh, presentation. We always learn, learn from you. Um, my question is, uh, in the patients who are having extensive calcification, calcific reverberations, uh, um, even those patients in whom there is no chronic kidney disease, once I have done the eye well, and otherwise also in the literature, these are the patients who made a lot of the slow flow, even after the IVL I have seen. So uh, once your patient like this gentleman with the CKD, and you are not doing the check, short after IVAL or after pre-dilatation, how do we assess with the imaging that the patient has developed the slow flow, you have to do some pharmacotherapy or something else uh, at that stage or slow down rather than reaching the final stage immediately? So if um, let me, I have some difficulties in, in hearing you, but you are saying that with IBUS you may have difficulties in seeing the, the depth of calcification? No. Um, the, how do you assess that the patient has not developed the slow flow or no reflow yeah. while you have been doing the IVL or yes. the pre-dilatation and uh, you continue your procedure sure. at the end of the procedure when you do the final check you see that there is no flow sure. over there so I mean. that is very important and you know there are many today we are focusing strictly on the on the case but we did not cover aspects that have to do with the preparation of the patient uh, one uh, to us one important aspect of these patients is to use um, mild sedation not a complete sedation. It's very important that the patient is able to report to you if the patient has chest pain or whatever. This is something that is important because sometimes that is what will make you shift to contrast mode to check if a side branch has been occluded or if you have non-reflow or whatever. <laughs> non-reflow will happen irrespective that you use contrast or not. It's something that will happen and has an expression that has to do with EKG changes, with chest pain, with hemodynamics. At any time that you want to clarify what is happening and contrast is the solution, of course, you move to it. Um, and, you know, in sometimes what happens in a very complex case is that everything goes very well, but suddenly you have a complication. Imagine a perforation. A patient with this degree of calcification is something that may happen. But you have, you have already spared the contrast in the first hour or one hour and a half. And now you, are, you have to use contrast to use it, you know? Although, as I say, again, I can share with you cases that we have of side branch occlusion, and how we diagnose that. And once that you know that the branch is occluded, believe me, there is nothing magic in giving contrast. You can apply exactly the same thing of going with, a, with another wire, perform kissing, check with physiology that you have opened the same branch, whatever. That takes me to the next question, Goran. Actually, time in the cath lab, in a busy cath lab, you know, some, we have a lot of volume. So how much this 
affects the time of the procedure. I mean, if I compare this case, compared to a regular case, using as much as that you want, and routinely, how much time extra, if you could just guess, give me a figure on that, and then I will hear from the colleagues how would they look at yeah. it. Yeah, you know, that Arif, the, the question that you are making is one of the big, big questions in interventional cardiology nowadays. And it's the fact that um, if, you ha if you are going to embark into doing uh, interventions in patients with chronic coronary syndrome, you have to do it well. Full stop. I mean, you really have to do a good job. But at the same time, because PC, uh, PCI has become something easy and etc. You may have constraints, and you may have constraints also and, uh, that come from the institution of saying, listen, you have 20 patients to be done today. The big question is, can we do 20 patients like this every day? I think, but honestly, I do not believe we can do 20 cases like this. So, or, or CTOs, for example. So I think that that will take us to a very important and fundamental question is, how we change the mindset, not only in terms of, change of uh, the amount of contrast that we give to patients, how we change the mindset about the fact that revascularization, complex PCI, has to be performed with um, cath lab time, uh, proper gear, et cetera, et cetera. And even, you know, to the concept of referral, because, again, and, and, and I think, that allow me just 30 seconds to speak about this, because I think it's very important. Oh, no. Absolutely. In many occasions, people will ask me, how would you do this without hours? How, how would you do this without therectomy? How would you do this? And then I say, well, how would you treat a patient with left main triple vessel disease if you don't have surgery? And to me, there are only two solutions. You send the patient somewhere else, or to get surgery. <laughs> this is the only way. But you are not enabled to say, because I don't have surgery, I will go ahead. And this is something that we accept for multivessel disease, for complex cases, and we should start to understand that these very complex cases, you know, either you have the time and dedication, or otherwise you may find a way of, of, of delegating. That takes me direct to you, Dr. Medved, again. In your cath lab, would you consider something like CTO program, like this kind of establishing a case like complex like this to have it in the early morning, a day, fixed day, not in the middle of the routine where you are in hectic? How would you do So I'm, I'm not a CTO operator, but we do have a CTO program and we do limit the number of cases that are being done in that particular lab. And you have to use all your armamentarium, but I mean, back to low contrast PCI. Um, I think we ha you have to go through the learning curve with your team. Mm -hmm. And we were learning that there are certain steps that if we do without contrast, we're actually more specific and more accurate. For example, I like bifurcations. I've learned that if I use enhanced imaging instead of puffs, I can position my balloon far better. When I'm con concerned about fracture or underexpanded stents and so on, again, contrast doesn't help you enhanced imaging does. So I think in the process of learning to be conscious of how much contrast we're using, we're learning the benefits of low contrast and how to use the machines and the tools available to us, such as keeping a wire to tell you where your side branch is instead of injecting, and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a learning process, but I think we can get there. But would you consider this kind of case preparation? Because he said, Dr. Hafi, in the beginning, identify the case, prepare the case, so my point was, do you consider such a complex case, this was a complex case, to get it done in the early morning, or it doesn't matter? You will start it even in the middle of the day. It doesn't matter, because time factor will be effective. That's what I was saying. Uh, I mean, I don't think middle of the day, or I wouldn't start it at the end of the day, and I would keep the day very light. Um, preferably early morning, especially if I need backup anesthesia or backup so surgery. You would prepare this kind of case. Amar, how would you approach the same case like he did, uh, Javier? Uh, we have two days in our hospital for CTU and complex PCI, right. but we work from morning to late afternoon, so uh, not necessarily in the morning, actually. Right. Yeah. right. Ronnie? Uh, we, do, we do the same thing, two days for the complex cases. Excellent. Um, Excellent. I, I think, I, you know, just the one thing that it's almost like we should think of every time we do a diagnostic angiogram or any angiogram as a diagnostic test. And so before you give the injection, ask yourself, what are you actually looking for? Because to do it out of just curiosity, it's like we're just sending patients for testing. And so I think you're sort of conscious. I'm looking for a dissection. I'm looking because I think I lost a side branch. Uh, and you find actually, I find sometimes without the puffs, you'll work faster. 
For a last, well, uh, for a last question, I want to be, sh- ask very short. We are running question. out of time. I'm just quick. Very short. Because we are uh, uh, when you do dilated contrast injection, do you use high frame rate like 30, or you keep the same? 50 percent with dilutive, and we just make. Uh, and the frame rate is the same, like 30. Oh, the, uh, we, we we raise the frame rate. Sorry. So in, yeah, yeah. in our case, we put in 25 frames per second okay. for that particular. He cannot give up. He's the city operator. He has to ask that question. So Thank with you, this, Arif. I think we need to close. It yeah. was exciting. Thank you very much, Goran. I think uh, I would like to thank all the my co-chairman and the panelists, the colleagues, all the attendees, and certainly Philips for hosting us today. And uh, this was really an interesting session. Goran uh, Khafir has really demonstrated how easy the situation can be in a very complex uh, case. And uh, the aim was from the beginning we learned how to le- uh, we learned how to identify the case, how to optimize our quality of performance, how to optimize our uh, skills. We learned a lot of tools and tips and tricks from Khafir. It looks so easy, but there were a lot of experience behind this. I appreciate all that. I believe everyone, what our panelists co- uh, also suggested, we have to learn this, how to deal with this kind of uh, procedure. We have to learn and build up our experience gradually. And at the end of the day, the optimum result, the best clinical outcome is our aim. Looking forward again seeing you next year, hopefully. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.